Bank Managing Director, Mwangi Givaiga. Thank you so much for also honoring our invite. So shortly, we'll be taking a break. Remember that we're live on KTN News. Of course, this event is historical, and there's no way we could limit it to this ballroom here at Kempinski, and therefore, we're going, we are live right now on KTN News, and we'll be taking a break so that the news now can start at uh, 9 p.m. We'll be doing that in a short while. For now, though, I want to introduce our other guest, Dr. Muhisa Kitui. He is the Karibusana, Secretary General at the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development. Kiongozi Kinara wa Southern Media Group, wa Kenya, wa Kenya wa Likwa, wa Kenya Shmiwa, mabibu na mabuana amjambo. Uh, mimi na sana kwa fursa mmeni tunukia kujiuzisha na shere hizi za uzinduzi wa gazeti la standard zina sura mpya na taraji kwa pia ni fursa yetu sisi kuongea kuhusu mwelekeo wa mabadiliko kwa sababu niliona kwa mba theme ya leo ni kuhusu mabadiliko uh, for the benefit of my friend Bob I can now turn to English <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, um, Sam and your staff, for inviting me to join you and the other members of the Standard Media Group uh, family on this important occasion and to share with you some of my thoughts around the theme of change, the challenges and possibilities of print media today. You already had a very extensive uh, presentation about the challenges that are forced change on the print media. And I can't again say uh, the, the importance of uh, this step. But I just wanted to mention that there are a number of challenging changes around the world and around the country that force our hand when we look at what niche to position media in. And those of us who are not in the media what expectations would like to oblige some section of media to embrace as a national responsibility. One, if I may start globally, of course there's a lot of different challenges in the global setting that impinge on uh, print media. The first and most important is the information revolution. You know, today, Every three days, there's a generation of data equivalent to all human data generation since civilization began until 2003. There's such a phenomenal movement of data that it's beyond our comprehension how humanity operated all this time until our time today. But the negative, okay, the challenging uh, consequence of this phenomenal revolution in data generation, the exponential growth of analytics, the revolution of uh, artificial intelligence, and on-demand information, is how quickly news becomes stale. Or even more importantly, how the traditional notion of print media as a source of news has been lost. I don't think it's just challenged. Print media has a different role from being the source of fast news. Many years ago, when I was a student at university in Scandinavia, I waited religiously for weekly review, which arrived in my post every third week to know what was happening in Kenya. Today, a falsehood is posted on Twitter in Nairobi. I see it wherever I am in the world in real time. But more importantly, with a flood of information and misinformation, there's competition between delivery of news as information and delivery of news as infotainment. You are seeing how comic show shows like a Late Night Show, John Stewart, or Trevor Noah, are becoming a major source of information in one direction of, of American and 
the, the, the international audience, you have seen how Fox News has become the source of uh, divine news for certain others. They, they religiously embrace the news that you like. Now the phenomenon of how analytics is flooding us with the news they think we are likely to like is giving us a challenge to what is the value of independence. I have never been a believer in the independence of a media, uh, media house in terms of neutrality. And I have even more reason today to say don't pretend to be neutral. Neutral to what? In a world that is segmented because of different interests and competing interests, I think one of the responsibilities of informed news creation is give reasons why you think one direction of thought and one direction of policy is better than another. When media pretends to be neutral, it becomes a spectator and perhaps at best a cheerleader of political competitions that are always driving nations down the wrong alley. And as we all know, the political class has a short cycle of truth depending on the electoral cycle. And it is not the same as long-term national interest. And I think it's a role that media can play as times change, be biased in favor of certain set of values, be biased in terms of raising certain uncomfortable questions. And there are quite a lot of uncomfortable questions not being asked in this country. I was uh, sharing with Bob uh, Colimo a few moments ago. I was reading from afar the competition between uh, government versus teachers and government versus doctors and strikes in the run-up to an election. And I thought, I've also been party to this game in this country. We start asking who is right, the doctor or the government. But there is a very f dangerous phenomenon that started in 2002, which we have not addressed as a nation. When you have major groups, organized labor, pushing for a negotiated settlement on wages in an election year, you are exploiting an opportunity of blackmail. It led President Moy to be saddled with a crazy uh, teacher's award before the 2002 elections. He was not going to be there to carry the burden of implementation. I wish there was a certain move, particularly driven by media, towards a society which will abolish or suspend collective bargain agreements in the run-up to an election. To protect the public interest from short-term political interest and opportunistic bargaining with blackmail. Globally, there's another challenge that I think is important as we look as a country to where the media should be taking us. The dramatic changes in the fortunes of globalization. That today, we are in the 10th year of a decade when global trade has been growing slower than global GDP. The last time this happened was during the Great Recession of the early 1930s. How does it impact us? For countries with a limited basket of exports, you're not realizing sufficiently the long-term anxiety is about possible expansion of markets. And in my address to an annual meeting of African CEOs in Geneva last week, I said there is a problem of the African narrative. Africa's greatest opportunities to recover from the challenges of diminishing international market access is the expansion of markets in Africa. I have always questioned from the time I was a minister why governments spend a fortune to give ex keep expensive negotiators in Brussels and Geneva, pretending that they will negotiate until Europeans open up their agricultural markets, which they never will. And for half of those resources, we could negotiate more market access in African agricultural markets. A continent which is a net importer of food is spending a lot of money negotiating for a market to export food. Look at the neighborhoods, build regional value chains, build opportunities that are mutually reinforcing. There are narrative of Africa's trade for Africa with Africa is much bigger than we are paying attention. I was giving a statistic I shared with people the other day. On average, African countries 
have an average tariff of 8.5% for produce coming from the rest of Africa and an average tariff of 4% for products coming from outside Africa. This is the only continent in the world where we tax more goods coming from our neighbors than we tax those coming from Asia, America, China, and Europe. That narrative needs to be grown. I'm very glad to hear that part of the change is not just the optics of what we'll see in the newspaper, that you are looking about building a consistent profile for a business edition of your newspaper. It is overdue. A newspaper as political opinion must start slowly running out of fashion. In fact, I have this sense that in many countries, because of the loss of primary sourcing of information as a sine qua non of newspapers, in many societies you see newspapers becoming analytical pieces. What is the story behind the news? What are the implications of the different trends in the news? You are seeing this in uh, The Guardian, in Newsweek, and others. But here, because we are not on top of the news, it is on TV, it's on radio, it's on social media, we give political opinion as an alternative niche. Now, there is a limit to how much that is uh, a growth engine in the long term. And I want to urge that if you define a certain set of values and goals of society, you can start building analytical basis, pieces instead of political opinion as the main narrative from the print media. I want to share also one or two concerns. One, the standard as an important media house in this country must be among the leaders in dealing with discussing major international trends that affect us. I think the way uh, Kenyan media has discussed Brexit has been much more driven by the political speculation of it than about what concretely is, the, what are the perimeters of engagement? How do we talk to British public opinion as it disengages from uh, Brussels? I'll share one line that I've developed. I was addressing the first Commonwealth Trade Minister's meeting in London two weeks ago, and I said, there are two tendencies in the Brexit. One is a rejectionist, nativist movement. You know, uh, we reject Brussels because we want to, broke, want to control how many people come into our territory. The fear of the immigrant, the fear of the other. Fortress Britain. But there is also another trend which is possible that there are some people either who supported Brexit or are ready to live with Brexit, who are ready to say one of the consequences of the Brexit is that the hands of London are unshackled from Brussels. Until now, Britain could not negotiate with you about selling more goods to Britain. It was done in Brussels. Now is the first time since the 1970s that seriously the British government can say we embrace the Commonwealth beyond having to share the birthday of the Queen and having Commonwealth Games. We are ready to discuss market access issues with you. And I said, I hope it is this latter tendency that triumphs. And the best way to subject it to the truth test is to say, can we see Britain allow our produce a greater market access in Britain than we were getting under the Economic Partnership Agreement of Brussels? If that can come through, then we can say, uh, apart from European concerns about Brussels getting weakened, the Commonwealth family has found something to celebrate about the Brexit. But you see, there has to be a consistent message from the business community, from leading media houses, that presents an African narrative. Not just reacting that they're asking us, what do you think of uh, what the Brexit is? They say, well, it looks like uh, the Trump phenomenon in America. Uh, that is their narrative. That's not the African narrative. I'm sorry that I've spoken a bit long. But before I just finish off, I wanted to say a number of things, Pre brief remarks. With a changing audience and changing attention, you have an opportunity to look at what are areas where you could build new narratives. And as I said, don't be scared of being partisan to issues. Partisan doesn't mean that you support an individual political party. 
but I have no aversion to a credible media house supporting a political party because that party is standing for what the media house stands for. But show us that you stand for something. And let that be the narrative around which you assess the, the, the validity, the veracity, the credibility of the different alternative campaigns. Not just who is bigger, who is talking better than the other. And finally, a petty subject of mine. Globalization has been celebrated as spreading the wealth around the world. Where I sit in Geneva and I look at trade flaws, we sometimes are celebrating other people's narrative. The last 20 years of globalization took 600 million people out of extreme poverty in China, expanded Vietnam's manufactured exports to the rest of the world from $1.5 billion in 1994 to $125 billion in 2016. During that time, Africa grew from 60 to 90. Africa must find its narrative. We cannot just be responding because of the vulnerable, the casualties of inequality in the global production and distribution of benefits because of technology. I hope and I urge that the standard media group gets a footing into a new era, apart from the optics of a better looking newspaper, and apart from the championing of the current rituals of democracy in Kenya, you find some of these core issues that are important for the African continent and find space to encourage growth of talent that can meaningfully develop a refreshing narrative for Africa, for East Africa, for Kenya. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.